So it's lovely to see you all here. My name is Dorothy Maxwell. I'm the head of Davy Horizons, which is the sustainability and ESG advisory at Davy Group. And on behalf of ourselves and also our colleagues in the decarbonization unit, we're really happy to have you here today and to host you for the afternoon. And I, I know many of you know us and, and we know you. And since Davy Horizon set up in the last two years, we've been quite prolific in the Zoom space. So we've done a lot of events, but today is actually our first physical event. So thank you for coming along. It really is different, and it's really nice to see everybody in person. Um, I'd also like to say a welcome to those members of the Institute of Corporate Responsibility and Sustainability, ICRS Ireland, which Davy Horizons hosts. And we have a fantastic industry steering group for that, several of which are on the panels today. So if you're not familiar with that initiative, it is for sustainability professionals in business. We'll tell you a little bit more about it uh, on those panels, but you're very welcome if you're already in the network. So if we could just flash up our program, I'm just going to uh, explain some of the arrangements for this afternoon. So our aim really today is to discuss the latest trends and also best practice in terms of climate action as it relates to business. But we're really conscious of the context that this conversation sits within. So on one hand, we have climate change policy moving both countries and businesses towards a net zero emissions future by latest 2050. But on the other hand, in the short term, if you're businesses, you're very challenged with energy insecurity, high costs, and so forth. So all of that, for, for businesses particularly, whether you're a PLC or you're a private company, brings risks that need to be managed. It brings growing demands from your stakeholders. But it also brings a wealth of opportunities as we transition to the green economy. So we're going to touch on many of those points and more today. And you can see from the program our lineup so we'll kick off with a video from Minister Ushian Smith, and he's going to share his perspective on both climate and energy policy as we come up to the next International Climate Change Summit, COP27. That happens in Egypt in mid-November. Then we'll have our first panel discussion. This is chaired by Tom Tynan. Tom is our head of Davy Group Corporate Advisory, and that panel will focus on managing climate risks and opportunities to meet growing shareholder and regulatory demands. We'll take a quick break then, and then we'll move on to the next panel, which is focusing on how do you action and also finance sustainability in business. And uh, we'll hear some examples and learnings that take us both from the boardroom and the governance issues all the way through to the supply chain. And then our last panel, which is chaired by Dr. Jarlath Malloy, Associate Director of Sustainability in Davy Horizons, we're going to focus on upskilling and how do you engage your employees in business to really be effective in terms of climate action and your overall goals. At the end of every panel discussion, we have plenty of time for Q&A. So I know we have uh, some fantastic advanced practitioners with us in the audience today as well. So please share your views and use the opportunity for questions. And then we're going to finish at about quarter to five uh, with networking. So please join us for hot food drinks. But a real treat, we also have sustainable whiskey tasting. Yes, you heard that correctly from Irish distillers Perna Ricar, and thank you so much for that. And Dave McCabe is gonna tell us more about that on one of the panels, but certainly sounds like a win-win to me. Um, in terms of housekeeping, please be aware we are recording today's event. We will not include in the final um, video, which we put on our website for people who can't make it, any of the Q&A from the floor, so don't let that restrict you. It will just be the panel sessions, and please put your phones on mute. One final point I want to make, um, we're very conscious, I think, in this room that sustainability and ESG are jargon laden. Um, we try and keep it as, as, as least jargon laden today, but to support that, when we do an event, we also publish insights. And in about a week's time, we'll share with you two insights. One will be the key takeaways from today 
But the second one is called the ABCs of ESG. And in its first publication, I think we're nearly ready to rewrite again. So much is coming down the line. So we'll probably be, be issuing several versions of that as we go forward. But I hope that will be really helpful to cut through the jargon. So we're going to kick off now with um, a video from Minister Ushian Smith, just as I turn my phone off. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, I'm Ushian Smith. I'm the Minister of State in the government responsible for circular economy, uh, communications, cybersecurity, public procurement. And um, I'm very happy to be invited here today by uh, Dorothy and Tom to address you and just to give you uh, an idea of the government perspective on the climate challenge that we're facing, what we're doing and how that might fit in with what you're doing. And I'm aware that you have to find a way to finance your, uh, your environmental operations in a sustainable way. You need to find how you can bring your staff with you how you can make sure that they have the skills that are needed for sustainability. And you need to find how you can work with your suppliers to make sure that on their side, that they are acting in a, in a sustainable way. So I think we've got a few things to talk about. I'm very happy to um, maybe hand over to you, Dorothy, and see if you want to ask me some questions. Thank you so much, Minister. And we really appreciate you sharing your thoughts with us today. So um, let's start off looking at the current context. How do you see the turbulence on energy security and high costs that we're seeing impacting both the EU and the Irish climate change policy? Well, I think it strengthens the case for decarbonisation. Obviously, it, it sort of it shows us how fragile our entire economic system is that it was dependent on these pipelines to, to Russia. Uh, and so it gives us the impetus and the, uh, the political momentum to accelerate our decarbonization strategies. It also kind of reminds us that although renewable sources of energy are sometimes uh, criticized for being variable or, or unreliable, that there is also a lot of unreliability and unpredictability about uh, fossil fuel energy sources. We don't know what the price is going to be in the future. Basically. And it also reminds us that when we were doing those calculations about payback time, whether it's worth investing in decarbonization, that they always have that underlying assumption of what the future price of oil or gas or coal is going to be. And it's not always, it's not always that predictable. So I guess we're in a situation where our policy is already in place, um, both at EU level and at Irish level. We're trying to decarbonize to net zero by 2050. We're trying to cut our emissions at 50% by 2030. But now we're just, we're, we're given this, it's become real. We really need to speed it up. Uh, I had some people on side, some, some political parties on side. Now I've pretty much got them all on side. So there's, a, there's strong political will to get this done. And there's been, I suppose on our side, there's been, uh, when we set the sectoral emission ceilings during the summer, and there was a big debate about how much agriculture should decarbonize, um, the response to that in the end was to accelerate our uh, renewable ambition to add an extra two gigawatts of wind to double our, our, uh, our solar uh, ambition for 2030 and also to, to develop um, a large quantity of anaerobic digestion. So all of that will have policy implications. Um, the budget recognise that and will be funding it. And there are a lot of opportunities for business as well. Thank you for that. And that's great to hear, given uh, our business audience today. They're going to be really encouraged by that policy context. So I'm conscious that COP27, the next big uh, climate summit, is coming up shortly in Egypt. What do you see as the priority focus areas and expectations for that? Well, I think the context is very different from last year. It shows how much can change in a year. I mean, the invasion was um you know in in the spring of this year so we're now we now have a huge focus on europe uh i think that there will be a uh i, I suppose a, a renewed urgency in the way that people engage in in the in the cop 27 and um and i think that it's going to also underline the importance of uh, international coordination with um nearly every country bar one or two probably involved so i i, I really feel that uh I really feel that, that this is going to be a, a, a climate change meeting that, that, that makes progress. 
And I look as well at the kind of the output of the Repower EU, which I think is really relevant probably to, to the audience today. Um, because they focused, one of the things they focused on was how we can raise the finance for the, for the changes that we need to make and how we can do that in a shared way. So, you know, it was the um, response to the pandemic was the first time that common bonds were issued by the EU, where there was a sense that there, we were facing a, a challenge together and we needed to have that financial so, um, uh, solidarity. And um, Repower EU has said again, we are facing this energy crisis together. We need to have uh, we need to have some form of common financing across the EU, which will lower the rates for borrowing and will will provide uh, uh, you know what what will really be a wall of liquidity for um, for renewables. Okay, and given that most of our audience today are in business, do you see that mobilization of public and private finances being very important and part of those discussions at COP twenty seven? Yeah, I think it's going to be really important that as a government that we're leading by example, that we're doing all the things that we're talking about, that we're enabling business to make the change, so that we're providing both the information and the financing and the policy context and the skills. So, you know, one of the major jobs of government is to make sure that we're providing enough um, education and skilled staff into, into industry. So, with, and that was reflected in yesterday's budget and how uh, Minister Harris's department will be financing a lot of apprenticeships. I see a lot of opportunities around um, solar uh, installation and for electricians in the retrofitting area. You know, up to now, retrofitting has been kind of like a, a cottage industry when it's compared with building. So, with you know, we you have large companies involved in construction, uh, you know, who build hundreds of thousands of, of units. But really, we haven't had that in retrofit. And so what we try to do in areas like retrofit, solar, offshore wind is by announcing a, a kind of a, a, lot, a very strong 10 year government policy and saying, so for example, with retrofit, over, over the decade, there will be 25 billion euros spent. Of that 25 billion, 8 billion is public money. So we're giving a very, very clear context. And we've also provided where the finance comes from, because it's financed out of carbon tax and the carbon tax raises every year. And we've legislated for a rising carbon tax two years ago, which will progressively rise and rose again, even in the most difficult circumstances to re politically to raise carbon tax. We raised carbon tax again yesterday, raising an additional 150 million euros of which 75 million goes straight into car into retrofitting so we have provided a very clear predictable stable context for investment in retrofit and our goal with that is to attract the formation or the introduction of large retrofit companies that can do that can work at scale exactly the same thing with offshore wind with our seven gigawatts of wind we're engaging uh, closely with anybody involved in hydrogen uh, production and and export uh, we had a meeting of ministers from around the North Sea who came over to Dublin recently to discuss how, um, how they can cooperate on offshore wind, interconnection of ele electricity cables, export of hydrogen. And Minister Robbie Etten from uh, the Netherlands came down to Cork to discuss with the Port of Cork how they can work with the Port of Amsterdam on, uh, on hydrogen trading. So really a, a, a lot of this, there is, there is a lot of um, support going to be from, from government in a policy way but obviously we need to work closely with, with business to make this actually happen. So there's going to be a lot of uh, communication and a lot of monitoring of, of how we're getting on. And I think it's important that when we're making laws and making budgets and making policies that we're constantly going back to the industry and checking whether it's working or not. I suppose some of the major hurdles that we're facing are around the planning and the legal system. Um, and really, they're not, they're not to do with money, they're to, they're to do with policy, and they're really being focused on at the moment. And actually, part of Repower EU was to accelerate the planning system and to make sure that uh, large renewable projects are not, don't get um, mired in a sort of bureaucratic decision-making process. Okay, so it sounds like the framework is there to create a lot of opportunities, and we know that the green economy has significant opportunities for businesses in Ireland. Finally, Minister, what role would government like to see business taking in light of the framework that you've described and also those opportunities in the market? I think um, business can bring innovation to the to the market. I think they can bring their experience, you know, in this in the um, in the sectors that they've worked in in the past. Uh, I think that, for example, if you look at the oil and gas industry, they have a lot of experience in seabed surveys, for example. Uh, I think that you know the vehicle industry is going to need to change uh, to manage with electric vehicles. 
So I think that there is a lot of a lot of a lot of transformation is going to happen in business. But when you have a, a large transformation, you also have large opportunities. Uh, so what I'm looking forward to is a is a strong uh, coordination between government and business, where um, the areas that we're we're pushing our, our policies and strategies are linked up with the reality of what what it takes to to do business. Ireland is a country that has uh, done very well in the knowledge economy. Uh, we're in the pharma sectors and in the tech sectors, and we're also a country which has a, a sort of a strong emotional connection with nature, with our green landscape and our seas. So I think we're uniquely placed with our young workforce and a very high level of high tech education, both at third level, um, but also generally people are adept with computers compared to other European nations. If you look at the DESI rankings from the Commission, so I think we're in a position really to to do well during the green transition uh, and during the digitization. And I think those two things are are, are closely linked. Uh, a lot of um, green technology requires. A lot of digitization. So I think that we're, we're, we're in a very strong position for Ireland to become uh, a hub for uh, communications technology and green innovation. Minister Rossi and Smith, thank you so much for setting that context for us today. Thank you, Dorothy. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, this panel is Managing Climate Risks and Opportunities, uh, Investor and Policy Demands. Uh, I'm Tom Tynan, and I head up the uh, Corporate Advisory Group here in Davie. Um, I'm absolutely delighted because here on the panel, I think that we've got the full ecosystem of, of ESG from the corporate with, with Kingspan, the NGO that is developing the standard with SPTI and, and, and CDP, uh, the rating agency with, with, with MSCI, and bringing it all together, the actual user or the fund manager with Brian Kennedy here from Media Lanham. So just to briefly introduce each of the, of the panelists here today, Joining us from London is Alwyn Smith. Alwyn is the global leader of the CDP's Transition Accelerator team, which engages with high impact companies to set science-based targets and develop credible transition plans. She also sits on the Science-Based Targets corporate engagement team, and Alwyn has been working with both CDP and SBTI since 2018. And I think that is a period where both of those organizations have played a very dominant role in the climate transition globally. Brian Kennedy uh, will be familiar to some of you as the Senior Equity Portfolio Manager at Mediolanum, specialising in, in ESG strategies. Before Mediolanum, Brian worked here at Davy and also at Allianz Global Investors in London, and he has been focused for the last 12 years on ESG and climate-related funds. Brian also sits on the steering committee of CDP and the global reporting issue, the GRI here in Ireland, and also on, as Dorothy mentioned, the ICRS uh, Ireland steering committee. I'm absolutely delighted to have Elchin Mamadov here, the EMEA co-head of, of research for MSCI, which is probably the predominant rating agency. This is Elchin's first time in Dublin, so we're absolutely delighted to welcome him. Prior to joining MSCI, Elchin spent about 14 years at Bloomberg covering the energy, utilities and renewable sectors. So in the context of what the minister was saying about energy transition, it will be fantastic, Elchin, to get your insights as well. Elchin has also spent the last week on the road meeting with clients in the US, so hopefully we can share some of the perspectives there. Last but not least is uh, Katrina Nicholson. Katrina Nicholson is the head of research, sorry, the head of investor relations at Kingspan. She joined their uh, investor relations team in 2017. And during that time, Katrina has worked closely with the, the leadership team to develop the Kingspan's market leading sustainability strategy, Planet Passionate. And we'll talk through some of the details of what they have been able to achieve over the next uh, 25 minutes or so. so 
just to kick off of the questions and going back a little bit to what um, Minister Oshian Smith was, was saying, the Russian invasion of, of, of Ukraine has exacerbated the supply constraints in the global hydrocarbon market. And what was really done is focused a lot of economies to look at energy security over sustainability in the near term. And I thought it was really interesting because the head of the world's largest sovereign wealth fund, Norja, said earlier this week that investors need to stay focused on environment, social and governance issues, that there is really a risk that they move to a backseat position. So Elchin, just given your background in, in energy and, and transition and utilities, can you just give us your view in terms of ESG in this time of energy insecurity? Yeah, I mean, there is obviously a concern and it's partly valid that we are at the moment investing in either bringing back the old coal-fired power plants in Lignite uh, or even building out the infrastructure to import LNG and gas from non-Russian sources. Uh, and, and the concern is that some of that infrastructure will have to be there for quite a while and we're locking in the fossil fuels. However, like I, I do think that a lot of that infrastructure will become stranded asset in, in not so far away future. And actually, the current high prices of hydrocarbons and tremendous volatility in energy markets uh, driven by the fossil fuels will actually accelerate the investment in uh, clean tech in broader and in renewables specifically and, and maybe nuclear in some places in the world. Um, there are some challenges at the moment like supply chain bottlenecks, rising commodity prices that are driving up the cost of renewables. But even with those he headwinds, the renewables in most markets are still by far the cheapest solution compared to coal and, and, and gas and, and even nuclear. Uh, so, so I'm quite bullish on the nuclear in the long term. Uh, the biggest concern for me at the moment is the permitting issue. And, and like it takes longer and longer to build these projects. Um, but the EU is trying to do something about it. And the UK and, and a few other key markets are trying to tackle this problem to cut the red tape. And hopefully that will accelerate the green transition in the long term. Thanks, Elchin. Um, Brian, what are you seeing as a fund manager trying to, to, to navigate these markets? Sure, yeah, I mean, I mean, I would take a slightly bigger picture view on this and see this as a tremendous opportunity. Um, if we look in the very short term, there's obviously between um, you know, supply chain issues, as you've mentioned, uh, the war in Ukraine, uh, there's tremendous short-term challenges, but this really should act as an accelerator uh, in terms of building an energy-independent Europe, which is ultimately what we, what we need to work towards here. And this only serves to emphasize the need for that, um, as I would see it. I mean, outside of those, those short-term issues, it also highlights some of the second-order effects that companies are suffering from. So, for example, if you have a very energy um, dependent or um, a very energy reliant supply chain, I mean, you need to look at that as well because your costs are going to rise. The inflation is going to be passed through in your supply chain, which will ultimately end up impacting your earnings as a company. So there are lots and lots of reasons for us to uh, hasten that transition towards uh, renewables. We don't, we're not necessarily a continent that is uh, plush with uh, the sort of resources that, that can be easily translated into electricity. So it just um, emphasizes the need for that energy independent Europe. And that needs to be built on renewables. Alwyn or Katrina, anything to add to that? Yeah, well, I, I suppose one point that I think is very clear and one <laughs> obstacle probably for you know, really accelerating the tr transition in terms of energy efficiency and renewable energy has been cost. And I think one thing that's really uh, now I think we can appreciate is the cost of not doing it. You know, I think the Irish budget this week is 2.5 to 2.6 billion of just giveaways to, to make sure that people can afford to eat their homes this winter and that small companies can continue to operate. So now I think people can start building those cost risks into, into um, you know, viable investment into renewable energy and energy efficiency and if you contrast that actually this year i think it's uh, in the budget there's 2.5 million cash giveaways and there's 500 million in energy efficiency so something wrong there you know and i know that's something that has to happen now because of the immediate risk around people and social 
but but clearly we've been doing something wrong in our investment to date. And I think it comes down to, you know, unfortunately economics are probably still a more critical voting issue. And in carbon, while everybody says they want to reduce it, it's probably not winning as much votes as, as people being able to heat their homes in the winter. Yeah, I think I would echo a lot of what's been said already and, and probably also just say from the corporate reporting perspective, it also highlights the importance of companies having climate transition plans that are adaptable and, and responsive to, to such shocks in the system like this. Um, I think stakeholders understand that you can have a plan in place and then something like this happens and you will need to adapt that plan and it may mean that the decarbonisation is slower in the short term and you need to find ways to catch up in the long term. Thank you. Um, just coming back to you, Brian, because I think for the audience it's incredibly interesting for because you sit at the heart of the decision making with taking on board the, the data coming through from, from the likes of, of a CDP, the data coming through from, from, from MSCI and then trying to select the company, whether it's, 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 it's Kingspan. The environment has probably changed. There's a big overlay in terms of regulation, which has come through from the EU taxonomy to the asset management industry. Uh, without getting in, in, into too much detail, there's been some controversy this year around greenwashing on the fund side as well. But taking that all into account, Brian, can you just give us an idea in terms of your stock selection process, how that is unfolding at the moment, or maybe the debt selection process as well? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think we've seen, in my time working in ESG investing, we've seen a huge evolution. I think we've gone from a place whereby you used to just be able to do the disclosure bit, have a bit of a narrative around it, and you're fine. You're absolutely, you know, kosher as far as, uh, as ESG is concerned. I mean, now, you know, it has become a lot more complex. I mean, you need to be setting targets almost as, as a minimum. Um, and you need to have um, a demonstrable story there as to how you're going to achieve that. That has to have credibility within itself. So in terms of um, you know, how I might look at uh, stocks and uh, from an ESG perspective, um, it would be, I would look for areas where there are opportunities. It used to be that ESG was used as a, as a lens just for looking at risks. But I think now, given areas like um, energy transition, like the opportunities around sustainable foods, just to name but two, there are plenty of areas where you can uh, take advantage of changes in consumer tastes, changes in regulation, in order to um, generate alpha. So outside of, that's the pure stock selection process. And that's before we get into areas like engagement. And really that should be complementary within that. You know, as a bare minimum, as I mentioned, we expect that companies are able to disclose and disclose fully and have an exceptionally high level of disclosure. But are you also, do you have accountability within that? Are you setting targets? You know, is there a mechanism by which you aim to reduce um, whatever are the most material metrics for your business? Be they carbon emissions, be it water intensity, be it hazardous materials? And then also, are your executives um, accountable for that as well? You know, is, there, you know, is this going to ultimately impact compensation packages? Where is the incentive for senior management to deliver on some of the targets that have been mentioned? These are the kind of criteria that I would look at, um, for example. Is, is the risk within ESG, because if we look at the makeup of the, of the portfolios, Brian, it has largely been those companies with a, with a small carbon, lower carbon footprint, and that we're really missing a, a trick in terms of ESG needs to be those companies who probably have a larger carbon footprint or have issues but are improving at the most rapid pace? Yeah, I mean, look, I think, you know, again, versus a few years ago, we, the um, ESG investment universe is tremendously strat, uh, stratified now. Now, I don't think it's as easy as just, you know, buy the lowest carbon intensity businesses, which are just typically your, mo your least capital intense businesses. You know, if you're like a, an internet platform, for example, your carbon um, intensity level is going to be zilch just because you don't have any emissions. Now, is that a fair, is that a fair yardstick? I think not. You know, where is the intentionality around the business? You know, what are, um, what are you trying to achieve? And also, you know, is there a path for a company which is, say, 
on the opposite end of the scale to the US or to the internet platform, um, if you are you know, a cement and aggregates business, you, know, you are surely the companies who should be the focus for um, sustainable investors, the focus for engagement. You know, and also there's the most uh, space for a tangible improvement in terms of some of those emissions uh, type metrics. So, you know, what what are you doing there? You know, what you know, new and innovative technologies are you applying to your business in order to reduce carbon emissions, for example? So, I don't think it's as simple as saying, um, or it's maybe the lazy the lazy man's approach to just say that um, look, just pick the ones with the lowest carbon emissions intensity. I think it's a lot more nuanced than that, and I think it's only been going to become more nuanced within that. And I think a key component of, the, of that is basically going to be able to prove your trajectory. Elchin, have you anything to add on that? I think, yeah. If, you, if you're a special, let's say, a, 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 the largest bank in the country, you're a national champion, and you have a relationship with an agriculture company or an oil and gas company that you've had for 20, 30 years, it's not easy to divest, right? So that's when I think you need to engage and use ESG and sustainability data to say, okay, has this company got a target? Shall we push for it? You know, how achievable it is? Do we have visibility in terms of the past performance and can they deliver on that? So things like that. So unfortunately, more often than not, I see this exclusionary approach and say, now we're not just gonna deal with them, divest it and, and that's it. And maybe for some, for, for some people it works, but as our industry becomes more sophisticated, I think the engagement approach, which takes more time and more expertise, uh, but also can deliver the actual results is probably the better one. Um, Katrina or Owen, anything to add there? Yeah, I suppose that the contrast to, to the argument there a little bit is, um, you know, sometimes you, you have to invest in companies that are totally different, you know, and I, I, I use this example, although it's very controversial, uh, Tesla. You know, so sometimes actually there can be an exclusion criteria. I'm not saying it should be exclusionary because it should be engagement and it should be investing innovation and everything. But if some companies aren't moving fast enough or quick enough, then it could be just an opportunity for somebody totally new to come along to do a completely different because it's very hard for incumbents to change. So there's, I think both arguments work actually, you know, but um, there, there's, there, there are many industries that are acting and behaving much, much slower than they should be. Um, uh, even though they have the most power to change and the most power to move the dial in terms of global carbon emissions. So, uh, yeah, and I think it all comes down to engagement. It's so, so important. Alwyn, just looking at greenhouse gas emissions and going back to that point on, on accountability for organisations to be able to prove that pathway, what, what is the best practice that you're currently seeing from, from CDP and SBTI? Yeah, well, definitely when it comes to, to target setting, as I think everyone has, has already referred to a couple of times, um, really best practice is setting targets that are aligned with science and ideally actually having them validated through a body like the Science Based Targets Initiative that gives it that, that kind of rubber stamp of approval. And um, to be a leader and recognise at this stage as well, a company should be setting a, a net zero target, ideally as well, through the Science Based Targets Initiative. Um, and some of you may be aware of this, but the initiative um, released a net zero corporate standard about a year ago now. And that was against the backdrop of, we've seen this big proliferation of net zero targets and commitments over the past five or so years. But there was often quite a divergence in the definition of net zero that was being applied to that target. So that was causing a huge amount of confusion, both for companies themselves to navigate and also then for, for stakeholders like um, investors or, or regulators to understand, was this target, is this target truly robust? Is it going to get us to the point of decarbonisation we need? So to try to tackle that, then the SBTI created this standard um, to bring clarity. And really, its focus is on deep decarbonisation across all scopes. So it requires companies to set near-term science-based targets to have that immediate action over the next five to 10 year time frame, but then also to set a long-term um, science-based target, which is gonna require about 90% absolute reduction in scopes one, two, and three by 2050 for, for most sectors. And then at that point when the target's achieved, there will be some residual emissions that would need to be removed through, through high integrity removals. 
So really, um, I think it's about having that robust uh, standard and benchmark in, in place and companies um, before we're really rushing to all have the earliest net zero date possible. But if that net zero um, definition you were applying didn't um, you know, stand up to, to what science is saying was needed, might have been over-reliant on carbon credits, for example, then that won't hold up under scrutiny and, and that's soon going to be seen by stakeholders. So companies need to go down that avenue. Uh, Katrina, when, when I look at Planet Passionate, which is um, King's, Kingspan's sustainability program, you're definitely to the forefront in terms of, of, of ESG disclosure. You've a net zero target approved by um, SBTI, scope one and two, and also on, on, on for scope three. Um, but outside of carbon, you've got targets across energy, circularity, and, and water. So you've a very, very sophisticated engine behind. There's, there's a team which, which is, which is in, in place. And there's, two, there's two things, and part of it is to do with the discussion that, that, that we had a little bit, a bit earlier on. How is someone like Kingspan managing that barrage of demands that are coming through? How are you resourcing and finding that talent pool? And I suppose the other thing is being to the forefront and providing that level of disclosure is there a little bit of a risk that sometimes you feel as if you're oversharing? Uh, very good question. Um, so we've been on the journey. We've been reporting to CDP since 2011. So we're pretty a long time doing it. We have a lot of experience doing it. And it's, it's very hard. <laughs> like even CDP is very, very hard every year for anyone who's done it, but, but absolutely worth it. Um, the, I suppose the upcoming legislation and the, the, the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive is so broad. Um, and there's no real materiality overlay or none that they've given us yet. So you kind of have to assume everything's material, even if you believe it really isn't to your business. Um, so even though we're very good at reporting around carbon and energy and certain aspects of water and circularity, we don't do that necessarily for an investor point of view, even though that's great to have. But it's really driven about being able to deliver products that are differentiated and that add value to our customers on an environmental basis as well as a performance basis. Um, so even though we've got a really good structure around it, when we look at what's expected of us in, in two years' time, it is a, a massive amount of work. Um, and we've, we've had to set up a working group in Kingspan and divide it out again around, um, sorry, excuse me, across six executives to be responsible for the different aspects of it to, to really build up the infrastructure, the data collection, to be able to have an auditable um, set of data and process and policies in two years' time. So we, we felt like we were at the front, and now we feel like we're, we're running at pace to catch up um, at the moment. So I think, and I think any corporate who goes out on a limb around taxonomy alignment or taxonomy eligibility is, is taking a big risk because, you know, we, we don't, the auditors actually are, are still trying to, to staff up. Um, and, you know, it, it, there's not a huge amount of engagement around how they're going to actually audit this data, this huge amount of data that we're going to have in, in two years' time. So we don't know what that process is going to look like. We don't know if they're going to have more questions around a certain aspect or they may not agree with our assumptions, our, our policy or process. Um, and then we may have to say, oh, sorry, we said we were X percent aligned two years ago, but you know, on review, where we have to take 10% off that. And that's not a position anybody wants to be in right now because we've all seen what happens with accusations of greenwashing. You know, it's very, very risky. So I think corporates should start low and build um, and really make sure they're ready. And there's a lot of work to being ready for this. Just, just on that point around staffing and, and, and talent, um, how are you finding that in, in, in MSCI? I mean, uh, I think there's an um, arms race going on for talent. I mean, everyone is trying to build up their sustainability team, and, and that's a good thing, I think, um, especially particularly for more senior uh, hires. And yeah, me and my team will get LinkedIn calls all the time. But <laughs> the thing is that, <laughs> that uh, my approach has been to try to attract talent from other parts of MSCI that are interested in sustainability and climate and train them up. Uh, yes, it does take time uh, and there is a chance that they may jump the ship. But I think if you're, if you're providing the right environment for growth and, and the right working conditions, that can work in your favor. Uh, as a plan B, if you can't find anyone internally, maybe try to hire someone, and I'm one of them, that 
hasn't done sustainability, but worked in a quite related industry from outside uh, and, and, and trying to find a higher that is within the ASG, with an experience, et cetera, et cetera, should be the last option. Because then, yeah, you're just paying over the odds and chances are the same person, at least some of our clients are there, you see the same person popping up in one company, then jump into another, <laughs> then jump into another. So you don't want to deal with that because it takes 12 months to fill their, uh, 12 to 18 months actually, to fill their position, then to train them, and, and then they, they go and join someone else. So yeah, so I think promoting from within is probably the right approach. Can I, can I add one thing to that as well? I think you've got to promote it in everybody. Like, you know, there's sustainability teams in businesses, but if you don't have buy-in from, you know, we, we've over 20,000 employees. I'm not saying 20,000 are bought in, but there is a couple of thousand that are really trying to deliver on these targets and that are coming up with great ideas and, and things that maybe we haven't thought of. Um, we the grad program, uh, we, we have a big grad program and they had their presentations last week about ideas and projects. And one of them was, you know, compressors on our, our manufacturing lines and they were able to track leaks in it. And they've made, like in two sites, uh, were able to, to drive down energy consumption. They, they found one was on at the weekends when there was no manufacturing. So silly things like that, but it's now, like none of them are in sustainability, but they were able to come up with this idea. So I think you, you have to really mobilize that in terms of just the mindset in, across your workforce. Alwyn, what's it like at, at, at CDP? Because that's an organization which has expanded dramatically. And I think that you can probably give us a read in terms of the, some of the latest data in terms of percentage of MSCI that signed up to, 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 to CDP. But how are you managing the staff? And, and yeah, it's definitely a challenge there as well, especially operating in the non-profit space. We can't be as competitive with, with salaries. Um, but I think there is such a, a kind of excitement, particularly with the, the young new grads coming into the space. Um, so we've grown, we're, we're nearly 600 people globally now working at CDP. Um, but I think I'd really yeah, echo really both sentiments here, but I think um, El Elchin's point of um, not always looking for someone who has the real technical um, background, because that can be learned, but having the, the passion and the interest and the drive um, to work in this area is crucial. Um, and then, yeah, also just to Katrina's point, I've noticed it so much um, from engaging with companies how just in the four years I've been in this space, it's really changed from seeing sustainability teams as this quite sometimes siloed, separate and box ticking team to being really embedded throughout different departments. And the companies that seem most successful are those that have um, really shared the kind of responsibility across teams and, and made teams excited, feel empowered um, to get involved in the initiatives. Um. One of the positive things coming out of the taxonomy is the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive on, from January 24, but really for, for the 2023 reporting season, and it probably encompasses nearly all large European companies. But the positive is that it's going to bring a new digital platform for machine-readable reporting. And I suppose a lot of corporates are hoping that the format that that comes in, the fact that it's machine readable, AI will be able to use this as well, that it will be the holy grail in terms of eliminating the need of sending data to MSCI, CDP, um, Sustainalytics, and fulfilling all of those other rating agencies. Brian, what is the, what is the uh, asset management industry's view on what the CSRD is going to bring? I, mean, I think there's there's probably a couple of points there. I think it probably gives better data for the companies like MSCI and so forth to uh, work with in the first place. Um, and I think that these don't necessarily exist without a CDP. CDP's been there for a long time. They've been a standard setter in terms of environmental disclosures. So I don't think they're necessarily going to be going anywhere. Um, but um, I would say that for a long time now, it hasn't just been about disclosure. Like some standardization of disclosure is, is great, absolutely. But ESG research, I think, has for a long time now been more about um, materiality and taking what are the most material risks in a given industry um, and using data to explain those. So I don't think um, it's necessarily going to um, render someone like an MSCI or S&P or Sustainalytics um, you know, irrelevant. If anything, it just gives them a, a better basis on, on which to work. And you know, just as a, as a general point, people seem, I have an issue with the kind of myopic focus on ESG ratings. 
um, which it seems to be th like throughout my industry. Uh, but when there is so much more out there in the data, I mean, it's very easy to focus on a, a ESG rating, but you know, these are inherently subjective assessments according to MSCI's framework or Sustainalytics framework or whoever that might be. They're not objective pieces, right? You know, carbon emissions, objective. You know, ESG rating, subjective. And so the sooner we can get away from just that focus um, on short term or like short term focus on subjective uh, ratings and more towards you know bigger picture objective data like uh, carbon emissions I think the better for the industry in general I'm going to give you a chance to reply to that Elch ah. <laughs> <laughs> no 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 I agree that yeah ESG ratings are subjective and um, the the counter argument to that is that there's a lot of the times that I'm having conversation with someone and trying to explain what ESG is and, and people say give me a number. I want one number and I won't compare everything and unfortunately in real life there's no one number, right? It all depends and what a lot of our clients are increasingly becoming more sophisticated, what they're trying to do is use our data to come up with their own analysis and uh, identify their own risks that they think for their clients are material or not. So yeah, so I think that's where the growth is and and again, going back to this uh, CSRD and all these reporting requirements, for us, I think it's a growth opportunity because, like, yeah, we can sell a lot more data to, to, to institutions that need to comply uh, and to make their job easier. And also to pair that data that companies report with third party data and, and the models and everything to help investors again figure out can that company decarbonize faster or not compared to peers, what the benchmarks are doing, et cetera. So for us, it's growth opportunities, in any, if anything. But the way I describe regulations, like the, the regulator comes into a room, drops a grenade and leaves and lets the market <laughs> participants sort this whole mess. And again, are we providing the best solution, the perfect solution? Of course not. And whoever tells you that they have the answer is lying. You should leave the room immediately. But, <laughs> but, but at least, yeah, we're trying to tackle the problem by speaking to the clients, speaking to the issuers and, and everyone else. So yeah, yeah, it's a journey for sure. But yeah, and no one has the, all the answers, but we're all trying to figure it out together. I, mean, I would say, and, and it, it's, it's two point all we made earlier, and uh, something I've felt for a long time, that. You, know, you start seeing emergence of um, metrics that combine sustainability concepts with you know, financial uh, like accounting type metrics, like say the concept of, of green capex and green opex uh, that you mentioned earlier. I mean, there you're taking like typical capex, you know, a, an accounting term, and applying a sustainability lens to it. And that's, as I see it, the ideal world. You're developing new metrics which you know, combine aspects of both worlds. Um, you know, even emissions intensity, if you think about it in those terms, I mean, you're taking revenues or EBIT or whatever you want to, to use and using carbon emissions um, as, a, as a, a numerator there. So like it's, you know, I can see those becoming more popular. And as we start to develop um, more metrics like that, it becomes more useful for uh, the investment community as well. So. Originally, this panel was due to run until 3 o'clock, but we started at 2.30, and Ali, my colleague, is looking at me, telling me to, to hurry up. I have, I have a couple of questions, and we'll probably run over a little bit because I want to get out to the audience. But Alwyn, we focused a lot in terms of, of EU here, but a lot of the attendees here have, have business operations in multiple jurisdictions, and in particular, near a neighbour across the pond, the UK. And I think it's important to explain the upcoming requirements for mandatory net zero transition plans in the UK. And can you just explain what's happening there? Yeah, very happy to. So, so last year, the UK government announced that from 2023, large listed companies and financial institutions will have to disclose transition plans, which is a bit different to, to some of the other disclosures we've been discussing here, which often tend to be more backward looking. And this is much more, more forward looking, the, the planning to how to transition your, your business essentially to be viable in a 1.5 degree or, or net zero world. Um, so the UK government set up a task force in April to actually define the kind of template of what is going to need to be included in such a plan. Um, CDP is quite heavily involved in that task force um, with our CE or the chief impact officer of CEO 
is chairing one of the work streams. And I think that's good because CDP has been doing quite a bit of work over the last few years to try to define what a credible transition plan constitutes and, and what elements should be in it. So just to touch briefly on, on some of those and give you a sense, it's really needing to be like a time bound and quantifiable um, KPI uh, filled plan. Um, as as um, Brian's also mentioned, yeah, there should be financial planning details in there, your cop CapEx and, and OpEx. Um, also accountability uh, is crucial. So having roles and responsibilities and an effective governance mechanism for who's responsible within it. But then to my very very first point, um, which is it does need to be adaptable and responsive too, because we've seen um, things change. And uh, that's why as well, if you're being very transparent in these regular uh, reporting of these plans, you can say, well, we planned this, but X has changed, therefore for we're taking a slightly different approach. And that does, I think, reassures stakeholders that you're being transparent, you're being authentic. It helps to combat any accusations of greenwashing as well, if there's just more, more transparency. In the last panel, Tom talked about having an ecosystem. Well, I feel like I have a different type of ecosystem. I have from the boardroom through to the strategy and operations through to who's footing the bail, Barry, at your end in terms of the finance. So a different type of uh, ecosystem. And you're all very welcome. So let me introduce you to our panel. We have Carol Bolter. Carol is a chartered director an assessor with the Institute of Directors Board Evaluation Service, and she is a tutor on the Chartered Director Program. She is chairperson of OnPost and a non-executive director of several boards, and she also chairs the audit committee of the Department of Agriculture, Food, and Marine. We have Podrick Mallon. Porig is sustainability director at Kerry Group, and he is responsible for the implementation of Kerry Group's group sustainability program called Beyond the Horizon. Dave McCabe is a blender based in Middleton Distillery in County Cork with responsibility for the blending process across Irish distillers' portfolio of Irish whiskies. And part of his role focuses on sustainability and sourcing. We're going to hear more about that. He has also established the Irish Whiskey Academy, a center of excellence for whiskey education. And we have Barry Dixon. Barry has over 20 years experience working as Davies' head of research and as an equity analyst. And he now leads Davies' decarbonization unit, which supports businesses to develop products and solutions which enable their decarbonization strategies. And we're going to hear more about this as well. So let's start off with a little bit of introductions about what your organizations are doing and what we've been talking about on climate action. So Carol, I'm a massive fan of OnPost and what you're doing. You've been innovating for some time on tackling climate change. Tell us some headlines about your approach and some of the achievements okay. and how you've been doing it. Thank you, Dorothy. Can I just give some advice to people in the room before I start? If you really want to accelerate your learning on the EST topic, agreed to go on a panel like this because I have learned more. <laughs> <laughs> I have you know, invested in this, but it's, I've learned so much. So thank you, Dorothy. I didn't realize. Well, you're welcome. So first of all, let me say, UNPUST, um, climate action is probably one of the most important things that we have on our agenda at the moment. Um, it's critical to us. And along with the other postal uh, companies in Europe, we have taken five of the SDGs. So SDG 13 is critical for us. But well, let me just give you some context on the organization because, you know, when I was appointed to the board, I always remember the minister said to me, Unpust is a jewel in the nation's crown. And I hadn't realized that Unpust was such a jewel. But when I got, you know, into the boardroom and I looked at it across the organization, it's absolutely unbelievable. We've 9,000 staff, we're one of the largest, you mentioned 20,000, um, we've 9,000, which we, is one of the largest in Ireland. We deliver to 2.25 million homes or businesses every working day. We have 1.7 million people coming into our branches. We have 900 post offices broadly. We have a huge fleet. We have 4,000 in our fleet. Um, 1,010 of them are electric, which we're very proud of. We have 155 e-trikes. So we have a huge footprint and a huge business. And that's why the two aspects, when we did our materiality you know, assessment, way up there in the top right hand corner climate action came it was absolutely pulsating and john smith is here and john will support me in some of these stories i'll tell but when we saw this we saw the opportunity let's tackle our fleet 
and let's tack in our, our you know, in, in terms of our buildings, we have we, we travel 80 million kilometres a year. I was blown away when I saw that number myself. Um, and we have um, 2 million square feet under management in our property. So, you know, you, you might say that's, well, there you go. We have a, a simple opportunity to tackle those. We have done huge things, Dorothy. I have tried to research. I've asked so many people, where did this start? I actually feel a little bit of a fraud as a board member because I feel the organisation is doing it. It started somewhere. I'm told it goes back to 2006. When we went on this journey, we looked at the GPO. Apparently, there was an awful lot of emissions, as you can imagine. And then we went nationwide. Big, big pivot for us was 2017, the move to EVs. It was a massive business case. It was a leap of faith. It was a bold, brave decision because there wasn't a huge amount of research. But our CEO, in fairness to him, and his management team said, we're going to do this. And we moved a big time into electric vehicles. That has been probably one of the biggest game, game changers for us. Also, in terms of our buildings, I actually visited um, our Dublin Mail Centre on Tuesday in preparation for this. Um, and again, what I saw, you know, the cartons coming in, they fill them to the top. The less time we have to deliver, you know, in a van, we're reducing down emissions. It's absolutely unbelievable. I could go on all day, Dorothy. I better stop there. But there's a lot happening. No, but those two big, big pillars for us would be fleet and um, the buildings themselves. Thank you. Thank you for that. And Porig, beyond Horizon and the work Kerry Group has been doing and sustainability, it's happening for many years. It's very advanced. Tell us, give us the headlines from your world, what you're doing. Okay. Thanks, Dorothy. <laughs> Um, yeah, so, you know, our Beyond the Horizon strategy is, um, I suppose, based around this idea of sustainable nutrition, and, and our vision is to create a world of sustainable nutrition. So what that means for us is really two things. How do we help our customers to improve the nutritional profile of their products? But then how do we do that in a way in which we're improving the environmental or the, the let's say, the social issues that are well known and understood within the food industry? Look, I think everybody realizes the impact that, that the production of food and beverage has. Um, but we have an opportunity, both through our scale, but also the technologies uh, within our portfolio to be able to improve that all the way through the value chain. So, um, you know, I think if we think about it from a climate perspective, we, we started on the journey with um, SBT, the Science Based Target Initiative. Um, so we set initially our, our target around scope one, two. We had that for a, for a long period of time. We've been working on that. The scope three target, I suppose, was, was the newer piece that came on board for us. And, and SBT was great in terms of being able to help us to, to validate that and, and to know that we were aligned with the, the Paris Agreement and the, the temperature trajectory within that. Now, we, we started with scope one and two at well below two degree alignment. We've since gone back and, and upgraded that to 1.5. Um, we're doing that same work for um, scope three at the moment. We're also looking at the net zero standard that Alwyn mentioned. How can we align our net zero target? with the guidance that's been published by SBTI. So I think lots of work that is happening, but I think the important for us thing for us is to look at the impacts right through the value chain. So you know, our operational piece, scope one and two, that's probably the easier piece to do because it's in our direct control. Scope three, you know, we set this target, but we know there's a huge challenge in terms of having to move our suppliers or, or engage with them in order to hit that target. And then obviously, as we look downstream, what are the technologies and the solutions and the innovations that we can bring to our customers in order to help them improve the, the carbon and the nutritional profile of their products? Okay. And Dave, um, Irish Distillers announced a $250 million investment recently to build a new carbon neutral whiskey distillery in Middleton County Cork. That's fantastic. Tell us more about that and what you did. That's right. So um, we're based down in Middleton and um, what we're doing in terms of making whiskey today, it's for the future. And whiskey is in a very good place in terms of demand across the market. So to keep up with that, we have to expand our operations. So we're investing in a new distillery uh, adjacent to the current site, um, which will be in the, the budget zone of about 250 million. And the aim there is to make sure we can, to a degree, accurately forecast what we expect the demand of whiskey to be in the future and by making this distillery uh, will help create that volume for us. Um, when you think of whiskey, it must be aged for a minimum three years in a barrel before it can be called whiskey. So we make various brands, and um, not to do a plug here, but Jemison and, and Redbreast and a few others. And some of those have age statements like 27 years of age. So we have to lay down casks, barrels today to hopefully reach the age of 27, 28 for the future to satisfy those brands. But a way of 
maintaining our sustainability and doing that is improving the facilities that we have as well as the new distillery with a energy carbon neutral uh, consumption. So elements to the current site will be involving retrofitting on certain elements like our pot stills, which is a huge, large copper pot that we have to boil our spirit in. So with energy recovery there, we'll be able to bring down our usage um, of natural gas by 80 to 85%. So there's a few things there on the retro side, which will instantly integrate in the modern plant as well. Uh, other elements will be moving away from gas to certified renewable energy uh, and also biogas, which we'll be creating on site to feed our boilers. And I've heard hydrogen being mentioned here as a, a source in the future. So we'll be implementing boilers, which will be able to take up to 20% hydrogen uh, going forward. So a lot of the, I suppose, the capital investment going into the expansion will be based on sustainable methods to, to keep that carbon neutral uh, target by 2026. Really, really innovative. And Barry, we've heard three different examples from, uh, of innovation and sustainability from three very different businesses. You're leading now this new decarbonization unit in, in Davie that's focusing on the financing of a lot of the kind of things we're talking. Tell us what that is and what you do. <laughs> so thanks, Dorothy. And uh, so we set up a, a unit at the start of last year to help businesses to fund their decarbonization strategies. And just to put a bit of context around it, not that I'd say many people in this room need the context, but, uh, you know, the target to get in by 2020 was a 20% reduction in emissions by, by 2020, which we didn't meet. The target now is to get to over 50% reduction by 2030. And as Katrina said, that's not 10 years away. That's kind of a lot less than 10 years away. And that's a step change in terms of emissions reduction. And by sort of the most conservative estimates out there is that that's going to require broadly 100 billion of investment to get to that point. And that's just for Ireland alone. You start to look across Europe and it's clearly going to be multiples of that. And governments can do so much. And we heard the minister earlier give, I think, what is probably the most positive sort of policy stance that we've heard. And, and, and policy has become increasingly um, uh, positive. The, the, the rhetoric around policy and, and the discussions around policy have been increasingly positive. And you know, there's nothing like a good energy crisis to drive the, the, the move towards renewables. And that's what we're seeing happening, and it's great to see that. Some money will come from governments, but a lot of this 100 billion for here alone and beyond will have to come from the private sector, and policy will have to enable and support that. Um, but the private sector is also going to have to invest. And that's what we, we are really trying to do at Davis. What we've always done is you know, we know where there's capital, we recognize where there's a need for that capital, and we take the capital from the people who have it and give it to the people who need it, and we take a tiny sliver along the way, and that's uh, our business model. But, but it's more than that, and, and there is, there's, a real, uh, there's a real kind of almost national effort around this, that we, we want to be part of that transition, and we want to be part of achieving that. And so what we've done is, is, is obviously we're working with various different companies across various different sectors. And again, going back over the last 20 years, most of the heavy lifting in terms of the emissions reduction has been done by the power generation industry, by the, the transition and the very successful transition in Ireland from fossil fuels to wind, and, and now we're starting to see some solar, but a heavily subsidized uh, transition. But over the next 10 years, and you've heard the examples here and sort of on post in terms of we're starting to move into the harder to abate sectors around transport, around the built environment and around industrial heat to take three just as an, as an example. And on POS is really at the forefront in terms of that move towards EVs and that's fantastic to see that. But industrial heat is probably 37 to, 35 to 40 percent uh, of our emissions reduction. That's a really hard nut to crack. So renewable power is going to be part of that but things like heat recovery, things like how do you replace natural gas in industrial processes with renewable forms of energy, be that hydrogen, be that geothermal, be that heat recovery systems. I think, so, so, so what we've heard here are fantastic plans by companies to decarbonize their businesses, but they're going to need companies who are developing technologies and solutions which will enable them to do that be that around hydrogen, be that around heat recovery systems, be that about other behind the meter uh, power generation. And that's what we're trying to do is to help those new businesses to raise capital, 
in order to be able to provide the Anpos and the Carries and the Irish distillers with those technologies and those solutions. And, and that's really what we're, what we're trying to do. Excellent, fantastic. So you're at the pipeline end of these innovations to support businesses. OK, let's take it a step back. Carol, you mentioned where did all this start? And you're an expert on governance. If we look at boards, do you see, obviously outside on post, because you're already in so far advanced on sustainability, but do you see at board level sustainability being a regular issue that comes up? Is it prioritized enough? Are board members educated? Is it visible enough on boards at the moment? Well, I think for the audience we have here today, it, 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 it sounds like it's right up there on the agenda. But in the round, like I deal with a lot of different SMEs, I don't think um, boards really have got to the, the nub of this. They're grappling with it. There's an absolute dearth of skill great opportunity for, for the right people. But even at board level, so boards say, should we have a sustainability expert on our board? If you take on POST as a case in point, we looked at our requirements last year in terms of our board composition and our strategy, and we realized we did warrant having somebody. And thankfully, that person joined our board and started today with a board meeting this morning. So I can see a big difference when somebody has that sustainability lens. They ask great questions. They'll inform the board as well. But going back to your question, I really think there's a huge need for boards to accelerate their learning. Um, it is probably one of the biggest issues. Like cyber, a few years ago, all we spoke about was cyber. It was right up there as a top risk. I think this is becoming a key risk for organisations. The previous panel mentioned, you know, two of the key responsibilities of a board member is to look at the risks and look at the opportunities. We're all kind of very worried about the risks, but there's huge opportunities as well. So I think good boards, informed boards, will challenge, will ask those right questions. We had some training a few months ago um, on one of my boards, and it was, again, an eye-opener. Like, we saw a map of Dublin in 100 years' time, and we couldn't believe the amount of the city was underwater. So that sort of shocking kind of stuff coming to boards will make them sit up. But I do think, Dorothy, there's a long way to go. I think you will get some of it in the organisation, maybe having sustainability um, committees and things like that. But I just I, I, I can't stress enough how big a need there is to upskill boards in terms of sustainability. Okay, really, really. Can helpful. I just add one thing, please? Personally, I believe this will become a fiduciary duty. At the moment, if you look at the companies acting and look at those eight areas that we watch, it's not listed. But when I look at what's happening with legislation and, and the duty of skill and care and diligence that we have as board members, we will have to be able to account for this. Accountability is critical, and I think we have a lot of learning to do. Okay, that will be a game changer. Yeah. Porig, again, coming back to Kerry Group being so advanced on this and, and looking at the drivers that, that you will be experiencing now in that context. In the previous uh, panel, we talked about a lot of things like um, sustainable finance disclosure regulations, pressuring PLCs mm -hmm. uh, for information from the shareholder side. We talked about the corporate, so, um, the corporate um, sustainability reporting directive upcoming that will force you to disclose more. I'm sure you're disclosing a lot already, but, but even more, and, and in a, a certain type of way to suit that asset management industry too. So we, we heard a lot about, of that, about that. From a practical perspective in your world, how are you managing that? Is that your latest set of drivers, or how does that look for you? Um, I think it's it's another a really important one. So I, look, I think the awareness around the implications for that regulation piece. Like for example, last year, you know, the the premium listing rules in the UK around TCFD um, brought new disclosure requirements, mandatory disclosure requirements, and and, and Kerry was an organisation who had reported against those. Um, so look, I think all of those things are helping to. Um, build the momentum internally for more activity, but it, it's it's a case of trying to use that as a way to further that beyond the horizon strategy that we have. Yes, there are some areas that are maybe new or, or nuanced was the word used in the last panel. I think that's that's very true. Um, but you know, in terms of practically how we're dealing with that, I think we're seeing a much greater role for the the finance function within our organisation in supporting around the ESG disclosure piece. So. You know, we've a senior leader from within the finance function who's now taken on that role of head of ESG uh, and really leveraging into the finance function to help support, I suppose, the non-financial disclosure and taking the same lens as we would on the financial side um, to try and bring that same le level of rigor and, uh, I suppose, diligence and, and prepare ourselves for the assurance requirements that were, that were spoken about. But I think we have to balance that with the requirement, 
you know, uh, yes, disclosure is important, but we need to be also taking action in the areas that we know that are important. And again, I think, you know, there was a time when setting your targets and making your disclosures was good, but now increasingly corporates are getting judged on their performance. And, you know, unless we have that action that's happening in tandem throughout the organization, you know, the reporting is going to look, is going to look pretty light. So um, I think we're trying to work that balance. I think, as I said, the finance function is key, but then trying to leverage other parts of the organization using some of the disclosure requirements as further momentum um, on top of already the requirements that we're seeing from our customers, from investors, from our employees as well. You know, there's pressure coming from all of those different stakeholders, all trying to drive the organization. Um, and again, it's, it's about balancing that with, you know, how do, we, how do we get that and take it and make it part of the day to day for people uh, as opposed to having it set out somewhere separate? Absolutely. And when we were preparing for this panel, you said something that really struck, struck me with the myriad of disclosures and requirements that continue, particularly for a PLC on sustainability. Uh, you mentioned the amount of time it takes and the time taken away from the actual doing of the improvements. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I, I think you know it was it was spoken about earlier around you know the the requirement for talent and and the need and, and I suppose you know it's probably viewed maybe internally in organisations still as, as quite a specialist area. Um, so I think you know while these regulations and disclosure requirements are quite new, the specialists are probably getting diverted more towards those. Um, but again, I think that's compensated for then by. You know, Katrina mentioned, you know, bringing the rest of the organization on board. So we've got this huge energy within Kerry, you know, whether it be at a graduate level or people who, who truly want to get involved. So I think maybe there is a move there, but that's creating a space then for more people to become involved in the organization or in the sustainability effort. And I think that's going to be key to be able to, to, to strike that balance. Okay. And Dave, coming back to what you're doing at Irish Distillers, um, a lot of your work is focusing on the supply chain, and I mentioned earlier the whiskey we're going to taste later. Tell us a little bit more about that and what you're doing. Yeah, so um, one of our most prized possessions in what we do is oak. Um, everything that we make goes into oak barrels, uh, primarily from the States and from Europe. And it's a very hard project that we've been laboring with to work on the sustainability side of that. Um, one way to explain that is the, the barrels that we get in from America are actually a, a sec effectively second-hand barrels. So they've held bourbon and then we take them and use them. So it's a bit of a circular economy in the sense that these are second juice barrels which we'll use for about 30 years. Once they're used they go on to places like Cuba for aging rum or Scotland. So it could be maybe 100 years before that barrel is no longer needed or fit for purpose. Um, so trying to persuade larger bourbon distilleries to go through a, a more sustainable route for sourcing oak is a bit of a, a hard project that we've began do uh, we've started doing um, but it's we've got very good progress so far on the european side um, and what i mean by sustainability is going right back as far as the landowners of where the the trees are, are sourced from um, working with certain families in the sense that you know when the oak is felled for making barrels we're making sure that it's not just only the best oak that's fell leaving the poor oak standing, um, which are the, the ones providing the future acorns for that forest, which isn't the best oak. So it's a, a sustained way of felling trees. Uh, we don't want to be buying oak from land where once the oak is felled, faster growing softwoods are grown instead, like uh, Sicca spruce or for milling like eucalyptus. Um, so there's a lot of I suppose parameters we're now looking at when we're trying to source our oak and it's done through um, a kind of a non-government non-profit um, organization PEFC I think that's the badge you that's might be the wearing badge. Tell, tell, I'm well. sure people know but, but say what, um, what it means. So it's the program for the endorsement of fire certification and it stems right back to a, a kind of a chain of custody scenario so if you can show that where your oak is sourced the sawmills that take it, the coopers that make the barrels and arriving to you, you can maintain that chain of custody. You can show from audits which we'll get from PEFC and so on that the oak is coming from sustainably sourced areas. Uh, France, for example, is exceptionally good at it since uh, Napoleon's time. He knew to grow oak, not for barrels, but for ships for war. But um, <laughs> we're lucky that the oak never got felled, so we're using it. 
Um, it's harder in some places like Spain because it's actually quite fragmented, the land, in terms of who owns it. It's very um, private ownership. So we actually work with the University of Santiago in Compostela um, where we'll do research on what the situation is of oak in the Iberian kind of area of Spain and Portugal and actually talking to landowners almost on an individual basis and explaining that if they were to get some forestry management to carry out the, the felling, deciding which trees to fell, which ones to leave, that will actually drive up the value of their wood because if it goes for making barrels, that's the most expensive wood you can actually buy. Um, so it's trying to get individuals on board, explaining it to them. We're a large company, an individual landowner seeing us coming would always be seen in a negative way. Um, and that's just something that you're, you're constantly trying to, to shed, shed light on when you're talking to these people. Um, so the example with the whiskey that we brought today is to do with a, a family in, in Danville in Kentucky. They've been, um, I suppose, successfully regenerating oak in their lands and we've been working with them sourcing wood. So we procured oak enough to make 63 barrels with, which we then tracked the, the chain of custody through PEFC certification. Um, and we've aged whiskey in them and we can now qualify that as PEFC um, products. So we're trying to get there on 100% of all our European wood, um, but it's just a bit harder on the American side when we're buying essentially secondhand you know, as a second-hand vehicle and you're trying to get the manufacturer of the vehicle to start off sustainable in the first place. So um, one way to do it is through, through the marketing. So by highlighting that these products are PFC, the consumer will start hopefully looking for these products, which will then drive larger, um, I suppose, suppliers of the barrels to go that way as well. Uh, and also working with people who aren't related to whiskey at all. So we do a lot of work with um, Dr. Jeffrey Larkin in the States, who's an environmental ecologist, uh, forest management um, expert, and he's a lecturer. And his goal with forest management is to ensure that there is enough oak land and woodland to allow migratory birds pass from South America up through the north. And if the oak isn't there for them or the woodlands, you know, that's going to have a negative impact on wildlife. So we've worked with him who has a depth of knowledge and knows all the landowners who have the same like mind as ourselves. So if we can procure oak from those sustainable areas, it benefits him. But when he sees that the markets see a demand for PFC, uh, especially in America, it actually promotes what he's doing as a, as a result of that. So it's a very interesting, I suppose, um, dyna dynamism, if that's where dynamics, basically of working with people who aren't involved in what you do but we all have a shared goal to get the end result of sustainable wood. Um, so bit by bit, we can get there on the American side, but we're, we're driving through a lot with the, the European oak. Um, the European barrels aren't from a, a kind of a market where you buy them in a trade environment. It's actually bespoke barrels made for us. So it's a bit different to the American scenario. So by saying we need X amount of barrels produced in Spain, holding X amount of sherry wine to season the wood, we can then say, look, we want that all PEFC. So we work with a family over there of Coopers who we worked with to get them PEFC certified. We went to a sawmills in the north of Spain in Barala uh, where we got them PEFC certified. So we gone through all the, I suppose, the, the documentation, the red tape to make that happen. And they're actually seeing a benefit now because they supply barrels and timber to other people and they can now say that they're PFC certified, which other people are now looking for. So it's not something that's like a, a patent or a, something we want to hold on to ourselves. It actually benefits uh, a lot wider group. Um, and that's where we're kind of currently at on the wood side, essentially. Fantastic. So it's a beautiful example of natural capital that you made that business case for all of those different stakeholders and traceability in the supply chain, which any businesses here will know whether it's human rights or timber. It, this is so difficult to do. So that's, that's phenomenal. And we all look forward to tasting it all. So my name is Jarlath Malloy and I'm an Associate Director here at the uh, Davy Horizons team. One of the common themes we've heard all through the afternoon is, uh, is, is, has been about people. And if you listen carefully to the Minister and, and the panel since then, that has run through 
almost every contribution in, in some way. And I think in some ways, we, if you think about this, climate change as a, as a challenge, it's something known as uh, a cathedral project, a cathedral challenge, i.e. this is something that will span more than one lifetime, ours in the room here and, and, and the people after us. And the challenge, therefore, is to try and motivate people to buy into something that they might not necessarily see the end of. And um, I'd like to warmly welcome our, our guests uh, today who've kindly agreed to share their experience on uh, employee engagement and training to, uh, to deliver the change that we so desperately need. Uh, we're joined this afternoon by Derville Stapleton, Andrea Carroll, and Una McArdle. And let me introduce our guests briefly before we uh, jump into the discussion. Dervila is a business and industry program manager at Sustainable Energy Authority of Ireland. And her role involves the delivery of a range of supports to businesses of all sizes looking to reduce their energy use and decarbonise um, their activities. Uh, as a chartered mechanical engineer, Dervila has over 25 years of experience across a range of sectors including engineering, consultancy, construction, and energy. Andrea Carroll is Group Head of Sustainability at DAA, and DAA Group is the commercial semi-state company that um, manages Dublin Airport <coughs> and Cork Airport, but also in includes retail uh, holdings with ARI and management holdings under DAAI Consulting. Andrea works across the DAA Group, to set a sustainability strategy and ensure environmental compliance, as well as the advancement of sustainable aviation in Ireland. Now, she's a long history of success working on projects on environmental and climate, both in the private and the public sector. And indeed, while at the Sustainable Energy Authority of Ireland, uh, she set up the Energy Academy, which is a, an online education platform to help um, train and guide Irish businesses I think we'll come back to that in a, in a few moments. And finally, and last but not least, is uh, Una McArdle, who is the sustain Global Sustainability Implementation Manager, leader, sorry, for Dag Incorporated. And she sits within the corporate uh, EHS and sustainability function and has responsibility for internal and external engagements, sustainability learning, facilitating business and customer sustainability requirements as well as supporting the DAO ESG agenda. Uh, prior to DAO, Una worked for PwC, as well as government agencies, and she's also a fellow of the Institute of Corporate Responsibility and Sustainability. Thank you all very much uh, for being with us today. Um, Dervila, if I can start with you. Yeah. Um, tell us what SEAI is doing in regards to training for business um, on energy and, and climate. Uh, so SAI, I suppose a lot of people would know us through maybe home grants for solar PV or, or uh, insulation, but we also provide a range of supports to businesses of all sizes from <coughs> networking to education, training, through to capital grant funding for energy efficiency and renewable investments. So I guess, th you know, through our engagement with businesses, we recognize that a lot of businesses were really struggling to know where to start. Um, SMEs in particular were struggling with the resources and the time. You know, they're quite challenged in terms of time and, and the knowledge. So, um, you know, with, with that in mind, with those challenges in mind, we, we've been providing training supports, you know, on primarily focused on energy, energy efficiency. Um, but it, it's, it's quite difficult to scale up these supports when they're uh, classroom based, which they have been. Um, so we decided to embark on, a, on developing an online uh, training platform. So it's called the Energy Academy, and, and coincidentally enough, Andrea was um, uh, with the SEI. It was, it was her baby, really, so, and, I, and I took it over two years ago. But um, the Energy Academy is really a, it's an, a free online uh, training platform for SMEs, specifically designed for businesses. Um, originally designed for SMEs primarily, but actually what we found is it's very attractive to large uh, businesses as well. There's a range of about 25 different modules on all sorts of energy topics from, you know, behavioral change, energy and climate, 
through to, I suppose, energy efficiency, lighting and refrigeration, and also new technologies, including heat pumps, solar PV. Um, it was launched in April 2020, which was a good time to launch an online learning platform, um, whatever else was going on in the world. Um, and it's been, it's proven very attractive uh, to businesses. We've had over 5,000 learners to date so far come through the Energy Academy. Um, what we found was about 30% of our learners were from large businesses because um, they, were, they were able to reach their staff through this um, energy training. You know, we, we heard from both panels uh, earlier about the importance of empowering your staff, engaging your staff, and that can be difficult in an area that's quite technical. Um, so, it, you know, we've, we found that it's, it's been quite attractive to, to uh, large businesses as well. And um, we recently launched uh, a course on, on the platform called Leading Sustainable Change for Decarbonisation and it's very much focused on businesses who are looking to decarbonise their operations. It's, you know, it, it, there's modules on energy management, ISO 50001, so it's quite, it is quite technical but it's, for, it's aimed at you know, facilities managers but also sustainable, sustainability managers, um, you know, operations leads and it's, it's really about um, engaging your staff, you can demonstrate your commitment to sustainability, to um, energy management, um, but also, I, I suppose, you know, work from the from the bottom up, right across your organisation, to to make the, you know, to, to embed um, the behavioural changes that are necessary. Great, that's incredible. Five thousand. Yeah, it's great. amazing. Um, uh, Andrea, engaging employees then. A, a DA from different backgrounds and at scale is, is a challenge, not just f f uh, f for you at DA, but I guess elsewhere as well. Um, I mean, you have a lot of experience on this. W what do you think works? So I, um, I guess I have experience in lots of different capacities. I've also experienced programs that were um, built to engage, uh, to engage people on sustainability topics or other topics. And I've taken a lot of those concepts and applied them both in AWS, now in, in DAA and the learnings that I had from the Energy Academy as well. Um, often I hear this debate about whether it should be coming from top down or bottom up. It's not a choice of one or the other, it has to be both. It was lovely to hear Carol talking about how important it is to bring the board mm -hmm. with you. That's incredibly important. It's, it's good to get senior leaders on board. One of the first things that I did in DAA was took all of our senior leaders out for a day and a half training on sustainable aviation and what that meant because it leveled the playing field in terms of conversations that we could have at a senior level and the decisions that we could make. However, it's not good enough to do that without actually engaging everybody. So at DAA, we have a really big challenge. We have 19,000 people on the campus of Dublin Airport alone, but we also have multiple different airports globally and lots of people working in very different capacities on sustainability. So I suppose one of the first things that I've, I've done in my time with DAA, and I would have done this in um, AWS as well, is look at developing an ambassadors program. And lots of companies have done that um, in different forms or in different ways. But when you're running an ambassador's program or some kind of committee program, whatever that looks like, you need to make sure that you can scale, that you can provide responsibility and achievement for the people who are giving up their time to this. But you also need to find ways to, for them to feed back. There's no use people who are really enthusiastic, who want to take this on in addition to their job, but probably have no power or responsibility to make change. You need to give them power and responsibility in some way. It doesn't matter at what level that is, but it has to be able to feed up. So the whole point of the ambassadors program now in, AW, or in DAA is to feed back up to my team and to the teams working on sustainability across the organization so that we can get their feedback. What I always say within the, within the organization now is that although sustainability is my job, it's everybody's job. It's not just my job. So engaging people in that way is an incredibly important thing to do. I think when I came to DAA, they thought that I was going to um, massively increase the level of solar panels that we needed at the airport. <laughs> and when I came in and I started talking about, no, this is about people. It's all about people. Why are we going to capital infrastructure, which, at, as it was referred to before, we very much focus on, but become, could become stranded assets in future. People are our biggest asset. So if we can level them up, if we can engage them more effectively, I can build a little army of sustainability-focused people who know the business better than I do and than I ever will. Um, so that kind of approach has, has stood in good stead and has demonstrated viable results in, in every organisation that I've touched. Great, thank you. And Una, uh, Dai runs a sustainability, sustainability and ESG centre of excellence um, for, for your employees. Um, tell us about what you're doing and, and how you found it. 
Yeah, so we launched this at the end of last year and it really was an evolution from grassroots um, employee engagement. So going back when I started with the company 11 years ago and we had sustainability networks internally and this was really employees come together that were just interested in sustainability from all different functions and, you know, sitting in on monthly webinars, doing a newsletter and things like that, really just being proactive and putting their hands up and saying that I'm engaged in this topic I want to learn more about it but wouldn't necessarily have be working on sustainability on a day in day in a day out basis and what we've seen really is an evolution in job roles and across all functions where to Andrea's point sustainability is now part of everybody's role and we have really taken what we've done with the Centre of Excellence, we haven't created anything new. All we've done is really brought together everything that we had here and there when it came to training and development and expanded it a little bit more. So we have internal training, we have external training, we have partnerships with WBCSD through the education programme. We have been signatory, as I'm sure companies in this room are, um, to the UN Global Compact since 2007. We only just realised about a year ago that actually every company that is a signatory to the UN Global Compact has free access to the UN Global Compact Academy, which is totally online and open to every employee of that company as well. So all of these resources are out there. It's just identifying what is most applicable to the needs of the employee. Um, and it's really important, you know, the Centre of Excellence, our purpose is really to inspire and empower employees. We're seeing different functions within the company, like commercial, that are having to go out and have those conversations with customers about sustainability. So they're being more proactive, but they're also being empowered and they're more comfortable to have those because they understand why we do what we do. And um, earlier, Brian had mentioned in the first panel about compensation and ESG and performance awards. That is part, um, we have it in our company as well. And it's really important that employees know, well, why is part of my compensation and performance award aligned to ESG? What is What even is ESG? So we launched the fundamentals course on that to just give them that base level understanding because that performance award and compensation, it, it, originally it was at executive level. It's now across every 35 and a half thousand employees in the company. So it's good that they understand why and what it is. Um, and I think definitely we're seeing a lot more interest in sustainability and ESG across all the functions. So it's a big part of talent retention, but it's also a big part of talent attraction when it comes to graduates. So when we have the Centre of Excellence, that really picks up a lot of interest in those different uh, forms that we have with graduates as well. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, Andrea, you were talking uh, initially about the conversation you had when you joined DA about where you want to where you want to focus on upskilling employees requires commitment and ultimately investment. Um, just curious, what do you see as the benefits and practice to that inward investment at the beginning? Mm. Um, I guess the benefits are kind of difficult to make tangible in some ways, but in actuality when it comes to gathering the data, so the first session here we talked a lot about data and reporting and ultimately gathering investment and I always try to tie the work that our people are doing back to ultimately where the business is going and the choices that the business have to make and will have to make. That is all based on data and information that comes from the business and comes from the people. So when I'm going out to the business and looking for our ESG or environmental data or sustainability data, it's the energy managers, the facilities managers, the people on the ground who are giving me that information. If they're giving me bad information, then we are reporting out bad information. So leveling up, um, increasing our sustainability literacy, whatever way you want to call it, that actually has massive tangible benefits ultimately for the business. You just have to follow the chain of that information to actually see that and prove its worth. Um, but I guess where I'm coming to is that it's not only going to have benefits for the business in terms of reporting out, which therefore has benefits in terms of investment, it also has reputational benefits as well. Because when you have people, I can say all I want about how great DAA is from a sustainability perspective, but I have to say that because it's my job. <laughs> if I have somebody who's an employee talking about how great it is, or a graduate who's coming in and learning about this for the first time, and they're reporting that back, that communication is much more authentic, it's much more transparent, and it's much more easily um, accepted by others, so it also builds reputation as well. So they're probably the two significant corporate benefits that I would see from 
putting focus on this training and, and this education. Uh, would either of you, of, of, uh, of you want to add to that? Um, well, I, I suppose the experience we've had is very similar that um, employees are demanding really of their employers that they're, they're making a commitment, that they're demonstrating commitment. So by providing this training, that's one way of doing it and it's a very powerful way of doing it. So I think that's why the Energy Academy has proven so, so attractive uh, to businesses. Yeah, I'd agree. I think we have also seen, and what Centre of Excellence does is it provides training for new employees, but there's also that want and need from executive, the C-suite as well. They are having the conversations with their stakeholders, both internally and externally, so they need to be well equipped to be able to have those conversations. So they want to empower themselves, they want to expand their knowledge on those topics, and it's right through the organisation, like for sure. So it's really good to see that we are at that stage now where the C-suite are very much engaged, and I think that's very much reflective in the company's ambition and strategy and our sustainability goals as well as we move forward. Okay, thank you. Dervila, um, we're, we're seeing a growing focus on pre-competitive collaborations to support awareness raising in business. What's SEAI doing on this? Um, yes, uh, we are. Uh, I suppose what I mentioned that we, you know, as part of our supports, um, we convene networks for, for businesses, folks around businesses, and the reason for that is um, there's nothing more powerful than learning from your peers and, and you know, hearing the best practice stories from other businesses. So, th so that's really what we try to focus. And one of the networks we have is, it's called our Large Industry Energy Network. Um, it's about 200 of Ireland's largest energy users combined. I think they make up almost 20% of the total energy use in Ireland, probably 60% of the enterprise uh, industries. So big energy mm -hmm. users. So um, this has been this network has been uh, running for probably over 15 years and primarily uh, focused around energy efficiency. So we provide supports to the members in uh, achieving energy management standards, certification, optimizing ISO 50001. Um, we provide, uh, I suppose, just events on you know new technologies, that kind of thing. But one of the really powerful uh, parts of it is the special working groups. So this is probably smaller groups of, of companies coming together to tackle big issues. So it might be you know, energy efficiency in H, HVAC, for example, for a technical thing, or looking at data management, digital data management for, for energy. Um, and recently, we started focusing on uh, special working groups for sectoral decarbonization. So the first one we launched was around uh, dairy and nutrition. So that really, we've seen about 10 or 12 companies who are really competitors coming together to identify the big barriers and big challenges and the opportunities for decarbonizing their, their operations. So it may be you know, looking at um, decarbonizing manufacturing combustion and how they're doing that, looking at heat pumps, that kind of thing. And we br we've brought in, I suppose, international expertise, um, local expertise, you know, and, and also identifying how they can unlock funding to, to support um, the investments that they need to make. So it's, it's extremely powerful. I suppose we're, we're, we're embarking on a new decarbonization stage of it, so we'll see how it goes. But we're, we're learning, they're learning, and, it, and, and we've, we've seen the benefits of that. And I guess there's been massive interest over the last um, six yeah, months. Yeah, yeah. Uh, certainly, uh, I guess the, the business case is stronger. Yeah. Certainly, we've heard that. Um, a, lot of the, a lot of the companies that were involved, you know, they're, you know, they're obviously big users of energy anyway, yeah. and they, they were... Uh, you know, very active in the, in the network. So, but we are seeing an awful lot more of our members coming to us and saying, you know, uh, I, I really want to get involved this yeah. time. Tell me about special working groups. What's going on there, and where, who can I learn from? So, yeah, that's great. Great. Una, what what partnerships um, does Dave find valuable, and, and and how can you get this going? Yeah. So, we are obviously a large multinational company and so we have a lot of pre-existing partnerships so what we did was really look at our sphere of influence and who is within that in the outset like where do we have already prior engagements with different organizations so the UN Global Compact being one that was an easy enough one you know free academy WBCSD we've been a participant in WBCSD the World Business Council for sustainable development for many years they have an education program there as well 
um, even simple things like Green Biz Conference as well, we're often a sponsor of that. Well, Green Biz actually partnered with Wholeworks to create a fully online 10-week certified program on leading the sustainability transformation. So these were all pre-existing relationships that we had, but weren't necessarily in the education space from the outset. And then it, it developed in that way. Um, other new engagements and partnerships that we have and something that we want to keep in mind as well, we want to add, have these partnerships that are value adding. You know, we don't want to just train and upskill people for the sake of it because they're asking for it. We want to actually add value and bring purpose, like Carol talked about purpose in the last panel. We want to bring purpose to every employee's role. So we've also partnered with SUSHUB that are based here in Dublin. They're now a global partner of ours to deliver bespoke training. And that's something that there is a need for because there are, like we, this week they've done two masterclass sessions with our commercial and our marketing organization because there is a need there. There's a knowledge gap on how to converse with those stakeholders. They're, they're helping us to bring the outside in perspective, which is really valuable to us. Um, so there's a lot out there. Partnerships, I think it's really important to understand. Are, have they got the same you know, ambition as us? You know, do they really have the, the scalability as well? And I think what we've seen and again with the Centre of Excellence when we launched it was that we really wanted to, with the pandemic, we moved from having face-to-face -face trainings and things like that. So we wanted to see, okay, what can we do to continue to enhance people's development and career progression, but remotely as well. So all of these programs that we have in place are online and hybrid. And we obviously partner as well with internal functions within the company to develop training on their particular topic areas. So for example, a lot of people are talking about scope three. Um, it's going to be applicable to a lot of different functions, supply chain, purchasing, finance, when they look at you know, the reporting element as well. So short trainings on that is really, really in impactful that we find. Um, same with LCAs and product carbon footprints. Customers are asking for that more and more. Um, we're having R&D working on it, we have sustainability working on it, we have the businesses working on it, and it, we have a huge product portfolio. So it's really important that actually those folks within the businesses and within those functions understand what an LCM, what a product carbon footprint is, but also understand what the difference is between the two, because there's a big difference. Um, they take you know different time and resources as well. So. Again, short trainings like that are really powerful for us and they can be done in-house as well because there's a lot of expertise within your own company. It's harnessing that expertise is really key. Great, thank you. Um, as part of Davies' uh, commitment to uh, best practice, uh, the Horizon team hosts the Institute of uh, Corporate Responsibility and Sustainability in Ireland. Um, Andrea, you're on the steering group. Um, Tell us more about what it is and what the value is, as you see it, for practitioners in Ireland. Sure. I, I think it's coming back to, obviously, adding to the education um, discussion that we've had here. But earlier in the conversation as well, we referred back to the fact that there is a need for people to upskill in this space very quickly. And it can be quite difficult to find people who are... Um, qualified sustainability people. I, I, I use this because sustainability people come from so many different backgrounds. So it's incredibly important that um, sustainability practitioners do have some kind of professional um, professional development or, or professional certification that they can reference. Um, to date it's been very, I, I suppose the, the companies that have been offering that have been very engineering focused or, or kind of had a different slant. ICRS was brought over from the UK to develop a branch here. Thank you Dorothy for spearheading that. Um, I suppose to give that outlet specifically for people who are working on, I think it started out in C CSR but in sustainability more broadly because there is a need for that regular upskilling, for the, also that networking. Um, I often joke that there is a very small group of people in Ireland who've been working in this for, for a while and we know each other even coming today it was like a little mini reunion of people that, that I know and haven't seen in a while um, but there's a huge amount more people that are coming into that space that need the support to be able to upskill to feel confident in what they're saying as well so that is what the aim of ICRS um, is and I would encourage anybody who's in this space who hasn't thought about their professional um, development or may be aligned with this to please talk to me or Dorothy or Una is also involved as well. Um, yeah, Thanks. about it. Um, 
you know, we were actually talking about the uh, mentoring program uh, a little bit earlier. Do you want to expand on that? Yeah, so um, one of the benefits with ICRS, uh, the hub in Ireland here, is we introduced earlier this year the mentoring program, and that's really beneficial. My mentee, Saul, is at the back of the room today, and this is the first opportunity we have had to meet face to face, and she comes from CISC. Um, and it's really been beneficial for ourselves to be having those discussions to just learn from one another as well, because that's also another way to upskill is by being a mentor or a mentee. It gives you that opportunity to get a different perspective um, and it's very, very valuable. And it's really easy to join ICRS. You know, you just go to icrs.info. You can also go to the Davy Horizons website as well, where you can see all the board members and join a mailing list. And there's two um, membership levels. So you can be a, an ordinary member, so anyone that's interested in the topic, or you can apply for fellowship, which is what I did, because um, I've been working on it for, in this space for a number of years. And then you have to meet a certain criteria to achieve that fellowship status. And that in itself adds credibility to what you do in the work that you do. And I think it's very valuable. Um, but also as a board member and as a mentor, you're learning all the time because, you know, Davy Horizons always hosts different events, you know, through Zoom, this one today as well on a variety of different topics and that again is a benefit to be a member of ICRS is you can expand your knowledge but it's a really good networking opportunity as well to expand your network across Ireland but also with the wider programs that they have over in the UK. Thanks Tina. Okay I think uh, that brings us nicely to the end. Uh, <laughs> please join me in thanking our guests this afternoon, Dervila Stapleton, Andrea Carroll and Una McArdle. And can I also just thank everyone here for your patience and for your active listening. It's been a pleasure to chair the panel. Uh, Tom, you're going to wrap us up. Over to you. So just a couple of short closing remarks. Uh, just first of all, thank you so much for joining us and participating today. Uh, special thanks to all our speakers and for the event organizers, and in particular the Davy Horizons team. It's really interesting for me because we started out um, looking at the whole sustainability and ESG space about four years ago. And today, I don't know where I'm working because sometimes I think I'm in an emergency response department because we have Dr. Charla Malloy, Dr. Dorothy Maxwell, and recently joined Dr. Fergal McNamara. But one thing to say is that we do have a depth of expertise here in Davy Horizons and in the decarbonisation team a breadth of experience that is, goes back, which is almost generational in terms of, of the talent. So do please reach out to us. There were a couple of common themes or topics that sort of came through as I was scribbling notes for, for, for the three uh, panels today. And the key word that I have taken away is accountability. And that came through in the first couple of pan panels. It's about setting a target, but actually going and delivering on it. And then, as noted in this panel, sustainability is not top-down or bottom-up. It's not on the, on, on, the, on the factory floor, and it's definitely not just at board level. Sustainability, for sustainability work, everyone is accountable to succeed. And I also just want to finish on the point, and I thought that even though Carol was advocating for Tinder for sustainability professionals, and her daughter is in the audience. Um, I thought the message that, that, that I'm supposed to have, and I know that John Smith is here as well, was really nicely phrased to close on. Living leaves a mark, let's leave a one that we are proud of. It's a really nice note to finish on. So with that, we've heard so much about Red Breast Kentucky Oak Edition Whiskey that has a full supply chain to traceability to the task to the cast back in Kentucky, I'd actually love to go and taste it. So many thanks to Dave and Dee Murray from Irish Distillers for the special treat. That's in room nine next door. But again, thanks very much to everyone.